all that is as easy as just tapping with a phone or scanning a QR code so that your so-called better informed decision or conscious decision is actually easy and convenient and not just something for experts who are all into all the deep details of well-informed people. It's more like everyone can just do that. And the huge difference starts from that moment on, in my understanding, continues for the whole life of a product, since a lot of products carry certificates, labels, any kind of scoring information. In my humble opinion, it is getting more and more complex to understand these and actually know how to interpret them. The digital product passport is something that not only helps you to make that easier to understand, but also it sticks with the product and it stays connected for the entire lifetime of the product. Thomas Rooting is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Thomas is the CEO of Naravero. He is really a true advocate of the digital product passport. For those of you who do not know what the digital product passport is, it falls under the European Union Green Deal. Also, the taxonomy, the European Union ESG taxonomy, and taxonomies that are coming out, the CSRD, and kind of falls in that whole Green Deal. We will go into much more depth in this discussion, and this is specifically why I've asked him on the show. He is a very lucky man. He comes from a family of professor doctors at different universities and, and systems thinking and in mathematics and, and logic um, and had wonderful parents who at a very, very young age in the 70s gave him the ability to have his first touch of computers and technology and really made it livable for him to kind of get into that whole world of technology and, and computers. And then in 1981, he started to program the Apple II computers. He learned programming and got the Apple bug and uh, really set off on that journey. And I would just like to welcome Thomas to the show. Thank you for being here and joining me in this discussion. I um, also need to caveat, I'm an ambassador and on, on the board of Naravero because I truly believe in it. But that brings me to right off off the bat, why we're here and this 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 moment of this discussion and podcast, we are at a pivotal moment, uh, kind of what I would call the you 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 learn to program in, in Apple II and do some things with uh, technology at an early age, but we're at an Apple iPhone moment, so kind of a, a disruption that's occurring with products, with taxonomy, with environment, eco standards around the world uh, that's going to change the world in, in many respects. And I see it, you see it, and we're kind of the, the, the front runners in the space uh, uh, with the taxonomy. And that's why we're here, because I really want to talk to you about that, because there's a lot of people out there not understanding what, what moment we're, we're at, what, what's coming and, and how wonderful it is. And so that I thank you for joining me and, and kind of helping to pull back the curtain on what's happening and what moment in time we're at. Hi, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and for hosting me. Yeah, let's uh, start talking about this pivotal moment. You mentioned it already, the digital product passport. Exactly. Um, I, I liken it a little bit to this uh, kind of a moment of disruption, like the iPhone, it kind of decentralized, demonetized, it distributed, it took a lot of things, it put a lot of different technologies into the phone that we didn't have before, a clock, a wallet, a, a computer, 
calculator and, and many things that we didn't even know truly what we were getting in this phone. And I believe we're at the cusp of such a pivotal moment as well, not only with the European Green Deal, the taxonomy, but now something that's kind of at, at the beginning tail ends of all the things that are coming out as being released to the world was just voted on. What kind of moment is that? Do you see it at the same? And can you kind of give us a little bit of an explanation in your opinion, what moment we're in and, and why you're excited and, and what you're doing uh, with Naravaro and, and with this momentum, first of all? Well, certainly. Uh, let me start with the picture you just mentioned with the, the pivotal mm -hmm. moment of the iPhone putting so many things in one thing. Kind of the same thing is, diff is happening in a very different context. Uh, so it's happening kind of um, to every product you can touch. But before I get into that, what a digital product passport is and why that is such a pivotal moment, let me maybe pick up some of the other words you just mentioned, the European Green Deal, and, and why such a passport is related to it and so important. Let's say the European strategic, strategic plan of um, making the continent on uh, net zero and uh, helping businesses to establish a circular economy strategies, it all came to the point of um, we need to change a lot of things that have an environmental impact. And one of the key mechanisms that is strongly emphasized is circularity, circular economy. However, not such a big surprise, all of a sudden one realized circularity works only if we know how to handle things we have. And in other words, the European idea of the digital product passport is to have one digital interface to one data hub that knows everything about a product. And if you know everything about the product, its ingredients, the way it was made, every certificate that might be relevant, every substance or ingredient, and any option how to recycle it or resell it or refurbish it, then let's say if you have all the information available, that's opening a door into a world where it's much easier to live a circular economy, not only talking and explaining about it. So why it's pivotal in my understanding is once we open that door and every physical product has a connected, let's say, digital file explaining everything about it, that opens up a new way of interaction between customers and products not only to get all the information, but also to rethink how, how easy it will be to handle the product responsibly, regardless if it's repairing, refurbishing, reselling, recycling, or any other of the sustainable options. But I don't want to get too much into it all at the same, same time. Just to give you somewhat of an idea, in the last sentence, coming back to the comparison to the iPhone, the digital product passport, as it is intended, already now by the first stage driven by the European Union is one point of contact, putting it all together, all the information for the stakeholders, for the authorities, for the customers and the consumers in one single point of data access. And that's why I think there's some sort of similarity, put it all of the different aspects into one thing is what, the, what makes it so fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. And so I, I have had several companies over the years that produce products and I am always frustrated with uh, labeling and frustrated with the SKUs um, and the process because every country is different, has different regulations and, and things, not just with SKUs, but with labeling and language and translation and um, size requirements and, and certificate requirements and things like that just in order to, to be a SKU that ends up at a grocery store or an MS shop and a, a, a at all to go into market, to go into certain markets and, and areas. Years ago, I created a thing called the European or Euro Connect. It's connecting kind of all the European Union countries together with kind of one standard that is higher than the standard given, but it would meet all the standards within the European Union because they weren't all unified at that time. And back then I was saying, wow, we absolutely need this. This is so important. And uh, if I want to, to launch a product, I, 
in, in the past, I had to go from one country to the next to open up a market and do translation and, and labeling and all those things. And I was saying, well, why couldn't we sell the product through the, all the European Union? We, we call it the European Union, but that wasn't available. It wasn't available in the languages and the translations and, and all the things that were required to meet food and product standards for those regions. And so now this is coming, which uh, is, is a no brainer, just puts that, that light bulb goes in. And I'm only tickling on the surface of what my past experience was with products and, and what a game changer this is for each and every everyone out there. We're seeing companies uh, like Adidas and Patagonia and uh, cosmetic companies and food companies already getting ahead of the game, jumping on board with with uh, digital product passports. But a lot of people, when when they see and hear about it, they're like, "This is another marketing thing. We don't we don't really understand it. What what is this? Is a some kind of a thing?" But it's actually, and, and you kind of touched upon this a way to make business and transparency and products easier and more better reporting and better internal processes for organizations for a lot less hard at moving forward towards growth expansion towards scale towards traceability and transparency and many things besides the things you already discussed and, and what i just mentioned as the opportunities that i see I know you've heard about some reports that are out there and some things that are circulating around with the data that we have now. What are some other benefits or things that you're excited about or, or why um, uh, that we should know about that you would like to tell us about? Let's say that there are multiple levels. Level one is um, if you think about the B2B business chain working on a product before it actually gets on the market. There is always the issue of now more and more collecting the information, collecting certificates regarding environmental standards, social standards, and all the different aspects of sustainability. Given the understanding that a digital product passport is fully intended to be machine readable, this means all that information shall be available for all the different stakeholders along such a supply chain to really work with the data. If you think of nowadays, if you just get a photo of a certificate hanging on the wall in any factory, might be okay, won't really help you. It's a hard job to get that understanding what it actually means, if it's valid, and a lot of these details are usually challenging. This starts to be different on level one before the product actually enters the market. Then the, the second stage, if it enters the market and is, let's say, available at a point of sale, the big difference now with the digital product passport is the intention of enabling everyone to get a direct access to all that information, even being enabled to compare different products of the same class, group, category, and compare the different information that is provided based on the European Union's regulation. On top of that, there is not only an information requirement, it might also be a performance requirement given by the European Commission, what kind of products are not even actually fulfilling enough criteria to enter the market. So you may rely on certain aspects of safety, let's say the toys, for instance, compare products before you actually make a purchasing decision. And all that is as easy as just tapping with a phone or scanning a QR code so that you're so-called better informed decision or conscious decision is actually easy and convenient and not just something for experts who are all into all the deep details of well-informed people. It's more like everyone can just do that. And the huge difference starts from that moment on, in my understanding, continues for the whole life of a product since a lot of products carry certificates, labels, any kind of scoring information, in my humble opinion, it's a scale more and more complex to understand these and actually know how to interpret them. The digital product passport is something that not only helps you to make that easier to understand, but also it sticks with the product. And all that is as easy as just tapping with a phone or scanning a QR code so that your so-called better informed decision or conscious decision is actually easy and convenient and not just something for experts who are all into all the deep details of well-informed people. It's more like everyone can just do that. And the huge difference starts from that moment on, in my understanding, 
continues for the whole life of a product, since a lot of products carry certificates, labels, any kind of scoring information. In my humble opinion, it is getting more and more complex to understand these and actually know how to interpret them. The digital product passport is something that not only helps you to make that easier to understand, but also it sticks with the product and it stays connected for the entire lifetime of the product, which means if you later on think, on can I repair that? How do I get spare parts? Where do I get repair services? How can I change things? Let's say if you have a knee bike, which is a very common thing these days, and the battery is at some point not performing it anymore, how do you responsibly replace that with a better one, a new one that's actually working and keep your, let's say, product passport updated? So even if a few years later you want to decide for a new bike and think about selling your one as a pre love one to somebody else who would like to continue trialing it or writing it, and all the information needed to put it on the market is just a click away. It's so much easier to keep products around than often enough to, let's say, difficulty of putting products on the second market starts already with gathering all the information before you can actually advertise them. This is just like a first taste, and then it keeps going on for all the other aspects. For later on stages, like at any point of time when you want to return it or trade in, that can be so much easier. It's just a tap to get all the information that's related to it. Or even uh, if that product is sold further, like if it's um, uh, used clothing or, or good uh, uh, an e-bike that you're done with or, or you've outgrown it or you can't use it anymore, you can pass it on. And instead of kind of this uh, buyer beware, you can get a little bit more information about the product even though it's gone through some multiple hands. I can see that it make uh, ease of use for warranties and guarantees uh, of things that we do guarantee, but also um, we have this on, on labeling, uh, also not, not just disability sometimes where you'll see people in the grocery stores or in shopping things and they want to look at how a product can be washed or what all the ingredients are in the product. They're looking through a loop or they're trying to read the small type. Well, that that goes away from your product in some respects because you don't have to take up the landscape of your product with all sorts of tiny information about what it is because it's there in a digital form. So everybody's got a cell phone or a, a, a thing that they can quickly see that they tap it on the product or tap it on the barcode on, on the, uh, on the code on the shelf or, or different parts of that. And it just pops up and you can read it in the size. You can have it be read for you. And you have a great uh, saying with Naravaro is basically let your product speak for themselves. Let your product speak for, you know, out loud. These living products basically kind of tell you a little bit more about it. Do the deep dive visually, audio, large type, you know, for all sorts of people. So it just... And like you said, we're just tickling the surface of all the opportunities that that we're getting into that are actually benefits make life easier, not only for the customers, but for the the uh, producers and manufacturers. And, and in reality, a lot of marketing and advertising agencies out there are doing these labeling and designs of packaging and products and clothing for other people, it makes it their job and their lives easier to have that advanced step to be future fit on a lot of different products out there. You, I know um, there's been some studies and reports done through KPMG and, and others that are talking about a, a few areas of products out there and what the potential is. Can you kind of tell us about that and and uh, what you're seeing and, and how close to the reality those, those numbers and things that we're seeing and maybe help us put that into perspective, that understanding. Absolutely. It's some of the, the, the moments I sometimes experience were just so um, impressive in numbers that people are hesitating to believe them. But let me give you an idea. Deloitte, for instance, did a study on um, the markets within Europe. So the European Union with 445 million citizens, and they were doing a research only covering 
more or less five industries, packaging, food, textiles, batteries, and then the electronic and appliances sector, which is by far not the entire world of physical products. So why the legislation talks about every product you can touch. This only talks about five sectors. It does not talk globally, it just talks about Europe. But within this, once these five sectors are fully activated, supporting the digital product passport by these requirements, the medium estimate is 5 trillion passports per year. So just, it's a very long number. Like, they're getting really hard to imagine, but think about that. Like, in every product you can touch within these sectors, so regardless if it's a, a packaging thing that might be a multi-use recyclable packaging thing, or if it is, as I'm saying, the textiles or any of the appliances or any food, all these are uh, and carrying an identification, enabling you to access all that information. Five a trillion, trillion. Yep. per year. That's a lot. And I, I just don't, I mean, people get overwhelmed with, with millions, let alone billions, and, and we're talking trillions. Sustainable development goals have um, $6 trillion a year to to be put towards sustainable development to, to reach the goal in 2030, which is 94 trillion US dollars. And, and we're talking 5 trillion for five sectors just for one year of products. To me, that sounds, and it's just the European Union. That's the other thing. That sounds really accurate to me, especially in our world of consumerism right now and all the different products that are out there, and even though we're just covering five. But for me, that is not an overwhelming or, or I say, oh, gosh, I see the untapped potential and opportunities for those products to resolve a lot of a lot of problems so i don't see it it's all of course it's a business opportunity of course there's um things efficiencies that organizations can uh can gain from having that and also a lot of ease of reporting a lot of ease of consulting and advising fees to to do a lot of things in the future there there is that opportunity but I, I see and sense something much more in the long term, not just for those initial five, but I know that there's a rollout where eventually every product that is produced is, is going to have such a DPP, a digital product passport, along with it. Can you tell me what some of those things are that, that are going to um, impact sustainability, impact the environment, help draw down human rights violations? global grand challenges, greenhouse gas emissions, waste, all sorts of other things that we're dealing with with uh, products today. Yes, uh, of course, you brought already like a few of the really important questions. Let's start with the last one, with the environmental impact. The first idea is that the past one will enforce economic operators before they put a product on the European market to make sure that anything that is laid down in the information requirements will be accessible easily in a trustworthy method without going into all the deep technologies, but it's more than just saying it's a good product. There is a lot of things happening behind the scenes, ensuring who is saying that, why is that trustworthy? And like a lot of these technical questions so that any information regarding environmental and social impacts may be verified, can be understood, can be checked and can be trusted in. And then the um, thinking about the other aspects when you and take it from a consumer point of view, let's say you and I, if you buy a product, one thing is to make the right decision when to buy it. And then there might be the other point, once you have it, how do you actually take care of it well? How do you repair it? How do you keep it in your life? How easy is it to access spare parts or repair options? How do you find someone who can actually help you servicing or maintaining the product around? And all these things. In my world, I would say that is a new single point of contact that is built into the product and will stay there. So it will be accessible, let's say, in up to two years. So the brand finds out we have a better upgrade option to keep the product around a longer time by repairing or replacing certain parts and making it more efficient, let's say, in energy efficient, for instance, having a better battery capacity. 
they could update the password and you could see what's happening on your product. My e-bike has now an upgrade option. Instead of thinking about whether to throw it out or not, you could just say, I would trade in my old battery and get a discount for the new battery and be fit for the next five years to have an even better battery than before. And so this kind of thinking, in my understanding, is a huge change. And the more I would take the consumer's point of view, it's so many more aspects. You mentioned in one of your first questions, can I read all the instructions? Are they in my language? All of that is so much easier if it's just happening through your smartphone in a standard way where you have all the accessibility support to get the information as easy as possible. Or even think about conversational AI as one of the topics of the day everywhere. Sustainability information is complex. And in general, I would say product information can be really complex the more you get into details of chemicals, ingredients, maintenance, and all that. Imagine all that information becomes available in a conversational interface where you can literally talk to the product. How do I repair my shoes? Can I replace the sole? Can I get a new battery for my e-bike? Can I eat that food, although I'm allergic for this and that? May I resell that? Can I resell it easily? Can I put it on a marketplace with, with a click in a second because I want somebody else to enable to have that? And without having a lot of barriers, which in theory could be uh, could be done, but let's say often I believe for people convenience is a key question to make things actually happen, not just the possibility of things. So uh, this is just like a, a broad spectrum of ideas what will help to um, make the use of products better. And in my understanding, there's one last thing which is not to be understood. Uh, to, mis- to be misunderstood, which is, sorry, there's one more thing that is not to be misunderstood. If, any, if every physical product has a digital interface I could talk to, could be a bidirectional dialogue, I can give feedback to the brands, to the companies who produce it. They can give me further information. It's opening up a channel of dialogue that has never been there before. And stays around for the entire life of the product. That's why I think that is so much in one simple appropriation DTP, more than just a little bit of information. It's a huge change. I, I think that there's, and, and I don't know how, how uh, you would phrase this or how we would um, uh, kind of shed the light on the importance of this as well. By having digital product pr- passport, that full trace, transparency, openness, what's in it, where it came from, you're also addressing some things in the taxonomy that talk about scope one, two, three emissions that can be included in there. That full, uh, where was the, where was it sourced? Where was it put together? Where was it packaged and shipped? What touch points did it have along the way? Where is your product uh, down the road? Possibly, you know, there, there could be a, a number of things that that are, are potential in there, but in this specific report that I'm thinking about uh, um, that came out is just by having that in a digital product passport, by having that transparency, the certification and that things, it already starts to address different factors around water, uh, precious resources, emissions, and and, and those things, which one uh, kind of removes the bad actors that are getting around the system and, and not paying a fair wage, not paying natural capital or the two true environmental cost of that product, also doing fraudulent or bad things. But it also uh, eliminates that so that we can now say those products that have the, that information and that transparency and that digital product passport, they're actually um, leaving the world, the, the planet, the environment a little bit better than they found it, but they're also being quite open of, of how they're doing that. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nudge and a movement in a right direction towards a more, circul- more circularity, uh, better sustainable practices as an organization, and it, and it improves. Are, are you familiar with the, what, I'm, what I'm talking about on that report and what kind of the things that we're seeing that those those five areas that came out in the initial thing, what potential that is to to draw down or improve uh, our environment? <laughs> to be honest, I'm not sure with five areas you just mentioned. There, there's, a, there's a lot of reports out there. 
but it, I think it was a, a, a draft that we first saw that came out uh, and it was quite some time ago. It was about six months ago. I see. I think you refer to the prioritization of the industries. Yeah. I, um, so coming back to the question of the, um, I'm not sure about the five areas, but we'll try to put it in names so that makes kind of a lot of sense. When the European Union or the European Commission came up with the idea of creating digital product passports and given this huge numbers, the overwhelming amount of digits in there, then there's obviously there is a big question like who is affected and everybody at the same time sounds like fantastic, but in a way fantastic, that's probably not actually happening. The Joint Research Center of the European Union was requested to work on the question, what are the priorities? Who is first? What makes a lot of sense? What has a huge impact on environmental aspects like soil, air quality, water consumption, and, and all these like different criteria? And so they came up with a list of priorities, scored them, and created a ranking, which was then in the end of the final text um, processed into something that is, as of today, a suggested work plan. And even there, for some background words, a work plan has two separate areas, intermediate products and end-use products. For intermediate products, it's pretty clear that iron, steel, and aluminum will be among the first ones who will have the requirement of having such a product passport. And from the consumer's point, end-use point of view, it's going to be textiles, fashion, footwear, furniture, detergents. And there are already ongoing new regulations for toys and their safety. All of these goods are coming soon with such a digital product test. That, I mean, that's so important. But do you, do you also remember in the report how it projected that the impact towards finite resources such as water and waste and and CO2 emissions that it automatically encourages more good practices towards that as well. Um, do you do you remember that, or do I need to include that in our show notes a little bit linked to that report? Um, I, 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 you, I'm just I'm not 100 percent sure which one you refer to. Linking might be good, but in general, let me answer that. And that way, yes, all these um, environmental aspects will be part of the sector-based, sector-relevant information requirements. So understanding from the European legislation view, the current new rules by the so-called eco-design for sustainable products regulation is a framework that is applied on different sectors. And for each of these sectors, there are more and more details specifically defined in so-called implementing acts. So these would exactly define what is the information requirement regarding soil, water, carbon footprint, other ESG parameters that are to be presented as an information requirement in a passport or might even have thresholds as performance. So if they, let's say, if the carbon footprint is worse than eggs, they cannot be brought on the market, which are considered to be a huge change. It's not just let's talk about scope three parameters. It's actually possibly prohibiting products from entering into the market. That, that's huge. huge. That's a, uh, a big deal. I, I know you've probably heard this as well. In the United States and, and around the world uh, who aren't affected with the European Union, it's not very many. In it, first of all, let me caveat that. But I've been at uh, EarthX in, in the United States, and I've been at some events where they kind of say SDG woke or this ESG woke in the taxonomy, and we're going to fight that, and we're not part of that. Well, is that real? Is uh, do they uh, get get the same understanding that we do, or are they in a totally different film? How would you uh, relate to those people who are kind of doing this pushback or saying that's that's not reality? Have you ever run into that, and what are your thoughts on it? Oh, I, I have. Here and they often enough met this kind of conflict question. It was, you know, some people reduce their view on just seeing the pressure and the restrictions and how to fight for us, their so called freedom. On the other hand, there are lots of businesses who are already interested in doing things better and appreciating if they can actually gain benefits from their visibility as well as their compliance to talk about these differences and fulfill them. 
And on top of that, regardless if you just feel like you must do that or you may do that, there is one more thing which I consider to be really important. Digital product passports opens the door for a lifelong interaction with your customer. I would say there are a couple of businesses around who don't care nowadays. And that's exactly the ones we probably will not see so much anymore in the future that who simply don't care about the customers once you sold once it's sold, it's done. It's much more this kind of relationship, even from a business point of view. Well, I can actually if I if I offer you to train in your old bike, that's new business for me as well. So it's sustainably not only thinking in environmental and ecological ways, it's also in economical sustainability that goes along so it's not conflicting but actually helping each other if i can have support and service options spare parts and repair your product and make it as a trade-in and give you a discount for the next one whatever the detail is from a business point of view there is not only a duty of compliance it's even a beauty of communication between the brand and the customer so i think those ones will be happy about this change to start. There is uh, uh, something that I want to want to share, and it is the keynote. Do you see this at all? This this coming up on the screen? Do you see anything on the screen? I see you. Okay. Let me see. Is it somewhere from the setting that I have to adjust here? No, it's okay. It's on my end. I'm just impromptu. You shared the screen already? Yeah, but apparently it's not showing oh, oh, that window, but I guess it's not going to work for me. You can send nope. me a screenshot. Then I can... That's okay. It was um, basically I was going to show um, the European uh, Union vote on the digital product passport and how how it passed. But that that's that's something I kind of wanted to talk about in, in this in this guise. The European Parliament, the commissions, the voting, the processing that they do on this is extensive. On the day that the digital product passport uh, was voted on, it was almost a 12-hour day at the Parliament with all the delegates and countries uh, there that were doing the voting. And the video that shows that process was 12 hours long. There were some breaks in between, but it was 12 hours long. And it wasn't until I think around the fourth hour that the digital product passport was voted on. And that was only a couple minutes of, of time in that video. One, as of the amount of policies and regulations and things that are voted upon for the European Union that pass. And what, what a miracle is that we came together and we, we worked through this. With the tax, the way the taxonomy works is a, a core commission of, of 40 people, and then there's a, a larger group of enforcers, and there's the PSF commission, and, and then many more things on the taxonomy. The digital product passport falls into another subcategory, kind of under the Green Deal and, and the eco eco product uh, things, and that's what was voted on here. And when, when we talk about it. I don't think we fathom not only the five trillion uh, products just in the European Union, and it's only five categories, but I don't think we fathom the scope of all the countries involved, not just in the European, those that receive products from the European Union, and those that that, that uh, send products out of the European Union and that are, are uh, the requirements of that, but also the process in deciding regulation, voting, getting into that that whole thing that is such a big machine. It's very political. It's a lot of uh, delegates and bureaucracy and things. And then when they go through that regulation process, it's about five to seven years, sometimes a little bit less, but they've worked over voting they've worked over the wording they've worked out how it goes out there's different iterations of that and when it's finally rolled out like the taxonomy was rolled out july 12 2021 we actually wanted to roll it out in 2020 but because of the pandemic and the brexit and the ukraine war and many other things going on in the world it was delayed a little bit 
before that rollout. And so when people see these new standards, new taxonomies, the CSRD, the digital product passport, they like, we need to catch up to this on oh, another regulation, but they don't realize it's actually something that's, and I, and I hate to be this way because I'm so excited about it, but it's something that's almost already a low bar or it's a little bit outdated because it's taken a long time just for us to get there. And so my question to you is, I can't, I can't believe that everybody is not looking at the DPP and saying, finally, my goodness, let's run towards this. Let's be future fit. This solves so many problems. I'm so excited that it's finally here. Instead, I, I'm sensing a lot of people don't understand it. I'm sensing a lot of people say, oh, it's a new regulation. It's a new thing that I've got to comply with and do this. I don't look at it that at all. But I mean, what are you seeing? Aren't you excited about this as well? And what are you seeing about those people that you explain your services through Naravero and, and what, what you're seeing of that? Is it also something that we should be excited about or so it's just another new regulation that's come out? Does it make us future fit? It's, it does make you future fit for more different reasons. But let me start with that. Why are not so many people aware about, about that big change? You mentioned that usually it takes five to seven years. The European Commission had a proposal of this so-called eco design for sustainable product circulation, which is the strongest horse, let's say that's the, the most powerful legislation among the other ones that are also affecting the digital product passports. But this so-called ESPR is the strong one. And it was published the very first time in March 22. And in April 24, we are at a stage of ratification. So everything that usually takes years, discussing, first voting, parliament, council, trilogue. The trilogue was already done early December last year. Usually that takes years to agree on the, the final wording, to have that ratified in April by the parliament in 455 to 99 votes. That is like, it's like light speed in the legislation process, if you don't mind that I'm calling it that way. But that is something happening so fast that let's say all the, I've been speaking on a couple of different events for small businesses, for all different reporting stages. And when all this evolved in the European Commission's research and the standardization and all that is kind of like super fast and it's not yet really understood even by media what exactly is happening there because it's fast. But I see more and more businesses in my world where we run, a, let's say, a bridging service for companies, that typically large or medium-sized ones, but also for small ones to make it easier to publish those passports. The first question I usually receive is, by when do I have to do what? And there are lots of different like, deadlines, schedules, depending on the sector. But once they realize, like, okay, for me as a brand or as a, as a manufacturer, that's not only what I must do, it is also what I may do. There's also a chance, an opportunity to not only list spare parts, but also maybe sell them or talk to customers to explain what do we do different in, in sustainability or how do we support our customers and, and all that kind of opportunities that make people think like, oh, let me start today, even if I do not have to exactly, and I do not know yet in detail what I have to publish. But I see lots of business who are more thinking about the opportunities and than, than just only the pressure that is coming up by the legislation. To my opinion, that's actually what I appreciate. People seeing both sides of the coin. Yes, there is a legislation coming up that will force you to do things. But there is a lot of opportunities that companies and consumers can actually benefit from. And one last part to the thinking about all the other regulations you mentioned, and CSRT, and this is a supply chain, due diligence directive, and all these things coming up. Um, they usually reflect only questions between businesses and authorities. What do I, as a company, have to write down so that the person who is checking that is happy with me? Fine. The digital product passport not only addresses businesses and authorities, but its key impact is enabling customers and consumers to make better informed choices. So it's, it's talking to consumers, to buyers, and not only to authorities. This is a huge difference why it makes so much more sense to see not only the obligation to do so, 
but also the opportunity to create a new communication channel. That's basically what I think. Does it make, uh, does it make the business to regulation and the requirements of compliance and reporting easier to have the DPP set up? Isn't that data already there? Isn't it already ready to go because you've already embedded it in the process of scope one, two, three with your product passport and traceability and life cycle and all those things in your product that so when the reporting does come about or you want to make sure you're compliant it's there because it's already done in the product he yes and no let me explain that maybe from two sides like the the digital products passport itself is not intended to be a track and trace tool it's intended to be a documentation a living documentation that goes along with the product so from a company's perspective there is the the need to provide information to buyers in the passport about, for instance, my scope 3 information that I might have collected or should have collected. And that kind of like helps me to gather all the different reporting requirements into some point of a purpose that is directly business related. I, I don't want to sound um, difficult, but let's say if you just think about the pure reporting standard, I do not know that many consumers or friends who are saying it's a nice Saturday afternoon, let me download that full report on ecological data and just read it because I'm interested in it. So what I think will help a lot is using digital product passports to give the, the subset of aggregated information a stage of visibility that actually is interesting for buying decisions, not only for documentation purposes. So what I believe is the passports are more than just a report. They are something that can be compared. So just give you an example, the, um, the European Commission is intending to set up a web portal. So you, you could compare two products. So the scope three analysis is not something as a business you do for the authorities. It will be visible there to compare products on their properties and characteristics. And so it plays a role not only on the investment market or finance reporting, it plays a role in everyday decision if you are easily compared to your competitor. And that's why I think that is a very good step forward to give that all the purpose. I agree as well. I, um, but I also see another aspect. I don't think that if, if uh, you don't have a digital product passport or if you're not ready for that wave and writing it in advance that you would be compliant with the taxonomy the csrd or the other things or have that data readily available on scope one two and three emissions but i think if you have a digital product passport and your products information and all that is put into a digital product passport and you have the opportunity whether you've rolled it out or not for your products to be in there, I'm pretty sure that all those other compliances, that information, that data is already there. It's not not necessarily needs to be there with your client, but it's in your organization and it's linked to that last leg of, of your product and, and to the customer that would then show that full transparency and that full, uh, the full scopes, uh, one, two, three as well, for to, to comply with that regulation, making that much easier and making your organization future fit. That's what I see see it as, but I, I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong, and I would love to get your feedback if you see it differently. No, no I, I totally agree. Just to put it in very practical words, if you are selling, I'm, I'm sticking back to the e-bikes, not only about e-bikes, just to make sure everybody has an easy understanding, kind of complexity like car or something that's much easier you buy more often you have an e easy imagination how that product is actually constructed out of different other products. So in your battery, an engine, a frame, tires, you know, combine that in a bicycle. So thinking about ESG scope one, two, three means if I am the economic operator who puts the bicycle on the market and I am reporting on the product level is at one scope one, two, and three, how do I get all that information? So if my suppliers are also required to provide product passports and they are machine readable and the information requirement is a carbon footprint, 
then it means the entire structure of collecting such data will be so much easier if it is in a standardized way part of an information container. So if I put together five components into a new product, and I get with these components already the, the relevant data, it's so much easier for me to provide that full information instead of doing research and trying to figure it out by questionnaires. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, it makes absolute sense. And so what what I'm um, hoping to achieve or kind of try try to set the tone of is if you want to build a ship, you do not drum up people to go out and gather wood, divide the work up, and give orders. Instead, you want to teach them to yearn for the vastness of the sea. And with the iPhone, with the digital product passport, it's um, not catching up to regulation or requirements. It's to yearn for the vastness of something that is easy and understandable. I, I, I think it's horrific, uh, and I have for a long time, I've, I come from the food space, that I have to look at labels and ingredient list to know that I'm not killing myself or that there's something in there that I don't, you know, want red dye number five or number six or whatever. I don't want to eat things that have chemicals and pesticides and, and things in there that I even have to go in and, and, and spend the time um, uh, of my life to look at, you know, where does this come from? What does it do? And over the years, just as a climate speaker and as a, 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 an economist and that, I've spent a lot of time, you know, is that a good product? Is, is that having human rights violations? Is there certain things like that, which is important for me as a consumer? Well, what, wouldn't it be nice if that was uh, taken out of, out of that? We had this grand vision that, that made life simpler. I, I'm hoping you and I aren't aren't in 10 years from now having this discussion, having a discussion, how is your ESG reporting coming? How is this uh, 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 new regulation coming? I'm hoping that through the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, through the taxonomy, through the digital product passport, that these things that are mundane and we shouldn't be doing in the first place kind of fade away into the ether because the standard has been set so high that we only have good products, that there's very little corruption, there's very little bit of things that are having human rights violations, human health issues, or um, uh, things that we have to worry about, that those are just, we're, we're conducting better business, we conduct better products that are just uh, more future fit. I, I, that's the world that I would like to be in. And I, I really see that this is this whole thing is a nudge in that direction. It's not dividing up work, doing reporting, and that it's this grander vision of what a future can be that leaves that is circularity, as you have used, as you've mentioned, but also is leaving the planet better than we found it. One thing you tickled upon, tickled upon in that is, is this, um, the, the form of circularity, which we've been trying to go and how, how this really solves a lot of problems with circularity. And I, I really think that's a key thing that we've always struggled with. How do we get that c circularity? Because there's a lot of traceability involved in that. There's a lot of data involved in that. There's a lot of things that we need to know. Is it in a circular closed system? Is it coming back um, that we couldn't do before? And I think this solves a lot of that problem. Absolutely. And um, let me put together the two questions of circularity and you just mentioned making life easier. Let's say from my point of view, if we would um, let's say have an anticipation, what happens when everything is set up and running? Digital pass passports are everywhere. Let's say it's all, it's all done. Then I believe so many of your daily questions become so much easier because if they are machine readable and it's just a tap with your smartphone, why not on your end have a preference profile like a matchmaking process? What are the products you consider in your world of decisions and the other ones not? So regardless if it's requirements you have in mind from a sustainability perspective, they need to be matching these and these criteria to be circular products. 
there might be ethical, religious, environmental criteria, or even we come back to food questions like food related criteria, and all of these could probably be part of your future preference profile, which just makes it so much easier in daily life with the chat with the phone to the product to see an immediate is this in my scope? Does it match my world? Or it's totally out of my scope and it's not worth spending a second longer looking at it and only if it's somewhere in the middle you might actually have a deeper or detailed look at it and see whether or not this is okay or not okay for you but let's say for from 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 now to then it's getting more and more complex to understand all the different criteria and data points so i think it is the only way that people in a daily regular situation will be capable of handling all that information that technology helps to do a kind of a matchmaking. A product tells you, talking wise hey, this is me and this is, these are my characteristics. And your smart device reads your personal profile and preferences and says, well, you are a good match or you're not. And so that way, making circular decision comes so much easier than uh, it's now. Well, you need to be an expert about everything. And I, I think you also addressing this in a lot of respects. That's kind of why DPPs are much more than a, a data sheet, a circular clarity data sheet. Or maybe you can go more into that. I, I, I really think it's more than a data sheet in Excel. It's, it's a really becoming a living, a living and speaking product uh, in, in a lot of respects. I think we're nudging very close in the right direction. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's say from a circular perspective, the, the product properties in a data sheet or certification are usually once published. But in real world, products change over time. If it's a good pair of shoes which has been resold, if it's a bicycle with a new battery, if it's a appliance that has been upgraded to be a better water saving machine from tomorrow on all these changes in products mean the documents documentation has to be living it's not just finished and published so it keeps getting updated that's why i think just a data sheet as we are like used to it's just not enough if we want to keep products longer time around we will have them for a longer while we will probably change components replace them repair them and all these are impacts on that product so i need the documentation that reflects that so that i know what i can do when i want to sell that or repair it and it's still up to date and it might be in the manufacturer in my personal understanding regardless of the compliance and the legal details it might be even the manufacturer who says and there are these more and more options helping you to upgrade or trade in or re resell or do something that helps you to maintain the product around. That is um, why I believe it's just so much more than being a data sheet, beside all the other things we spoke about with authorities and business supply chains. So what, what I really know about Naravero is that you're empowering customers. You're, you're not coming in and say, okay, let us do your, your labels and your DPP for you. You're actually providing a framework. You have a system. You uh, bring it in and say, we can put you in touch with your, your chief operations officer or write down in, in things and let's get you a system that you can get a DPP created for each one of your products. And that's your framework. It's your uh, coding. And it's whether you're a small company, you only have a few products, or whether you're a huge company like Adidas or like a, a Rave group and have you know, hundreds of thousands of products, you can go in there and any which way empower them to say, no, we, we need to do it all for you. We can help you and we can get you set up to do it yourself and empower you uh, with these tools to get it to scale. And your scale uh, currently is from the small guy clear up to, to a fairly large size that you could just uh, execute immediately. And you, you, in your portfolio, you have some some really uh, good uh, customers and people on board already that you provide that. I'd like you to go a little bit more in detail because when uh, I've heard some other discussions, we were just recently in Basel at the Vitra campus for the Chief Sustainability Officer book launch, uh, Leadership for Sustainable Futures, and talking to people who are kind of the chief uh, around organizations looking at 
at uh, the future of uh, all all different things and what sustainability factors into that with the taxonomy, with the digital product passport. Um, some people are kind of still misunderstanding how do we get to scale? Is that possible? Do I have to put everything into your hands? And can you walk us through that process and what opportunities and things you can provide and what empowerment does that give? How does that look? Certainly I can do so. And thank you so much for asking. The thought we had when we started to think about the Naravel platform is this is so much information and there are so many interfaces and so many different directions like authorities and data in your life cycle assessment systems, as well as your product information and your resource planning in the enterprise and like lots of those things. How can we make that so much easier even ones, but certainly also for all medium and small sized companies, companies since um, that needs to be easy to handle. And so the whole concept of Naravero's digital products passwords as a service is a technical platform giving you an editorial system in your hands that enables you to publish a new passport within 15 minutes. You drag and drop resources and content in a way that's that's like kind of like as you were used to building up the first web pages quite a while ago when you had like an editorial system dragging images and videos to, to the right place. Kind of like that approach to make it so easy to start with these digital product passports and grow over time. Future fitness, in my understanding, is not to have everything right now, but to be sure that tomorrow you can do the same thing and adapt to the new changes without adopting the general approach. And that's what the system is made for. It's a platform handling the information, providing all the interfaces, dealing with all the regulations to talk to different other systems in different regions, since Europe is not the only region thinking about passwords. So in future, you need like something like an infrastructure. And making that easy, that is the purpose of uh, the service platform we provide. I love that. Why is a consumer-centric um, so crucial? Why, why is it important to give this kind of back to the consumers and to have this consumer-centric approach? In my view, there is, um, let's say there is one risk associated with the digital product passport. If I would, uh, if, if I would try to do it, maximize contrast. If the passport is a reduced version of a database of environmental data, I'm afraid you and I wouldn't read it. There's hundreds of data points. I mean, sure, you are an expert, but if you, if you run around every day, do you really want to read for every product all the details? So what I believe is exactly what we need is it must be consumer-centric. People like to be more and more aware of conscious decisions but it doesn't mean every decision they want to do takes them 30 minutes to read through a ton of information. So that's why I believe customer centricity means it's not only to be informed about a product when I do a buying decision. It's more being my point of contact for the next five or 10 years. Products have to be repaired and even repairing becomes an obligation within Europe. The products need to be easy to repair for a long time. Then... How do I access that information? Whom to contact? How do I maybe do something on a customer replaceable part myself? Where do I get this part? And can I quickly order that? Or do I have to dig through a search engine in the internet for 15 minutes to find the right part number? Customer centricity means to me, it must be really easy to use from a customer point of view. It must be easy to understand. It helps me with instructions. It shows me video clips. It is connected to whatever is my daily need. Then I might even find it enjoyable. It might even be entertaining at some point if, if you think about auxiliaries or cross products that go along with mine. Then I have a good chance that everyone is happy to use this interface and is not more like, oh, yeah, there's another spec sheet. It's digitally available. Fantastic. But who cares if, if it's just that? So I believe we need something that is teasing people and it's is, is, is appreciating the attention to that interface so that I have a benefit in the use. That's why I believe so strong in the smart mix of requirement of information and customer centricity. I love that. I love it. Yeah, I, I agree as well. I, I, I kind of mentioned it before. I don't want to go through and have to look at all the fine print and all the labels and what's in this and, and that. Um, 
it's it's just overwhelming. Today, I do a lot of podcasts with authors who have written, you know, large, thick books and, and things. And, and I'm just realizing people don't even read books anymore. That's why I listen to podcasts and audio versions. It's uh, We're in this age of information overload, and we're creating a lot of waste and, and too much information out there. And we, we've heard about the digital uh digital information and digital waste and kind of what we're creating that that I think uh this is much different than that and it solves a lot of problems that, that makes things go in the background that should go in the background but it gives us that vital information when we need it easily accessible that doesn't get get us overwhelmed speaking about that complexity and issues and solving problems what will happen when the DPP once it's a, Firmly established. Once it starts rolling out, what do those phases look like, and what are the things that you've already found out, addressed, or, or know that problems that will be solved from it? And and do you think there's some that you you and I are even missing that it will solve that we haven't even thought of yet? So, um, well, I'm sure there are things we are missing right now, and there will be more coming up over time. But but when I see today, businesses, businesses are starting to um, get themselves prepared, thinking about the idea, how to aggregate all the information, understanding and probably actually realizing we can't do all at the same time. So we have to prepare and learn processes to keep them updated year by year and learn how to get all the information together. And that will be changing over time. It's not one thing you you just, split the switch and then 100% is done. It's more likely that we will just start with information manuals and documentation that makes it easy to use some of the footprint information, some of the sustainability information, and then it will just grow step by step, but probably year by year that we get more and more information which we can collect, aggregate, and then publish in these passwords, plus more and more services and features I mentioned to make the idea of not, not only from a manufacturer's perspective, having servicing options, it might also be, how can I sell my piece of furniture for our next life? The easier this is from the owner's view of the first life, the more likely it is it will actually happen. It's a big hassle to, to remember all the data when it was bought and what was the exact photography. And if it's like all difficult to put it on the market, it might end up in waste. If it becomes easy, more and more platforms might support reading in passports, checking them for authenticity, verifying that information, making it just much easier to set products on the second market or third market. And so I, I would think that there will be even a, probably over time an ecosystem of companies thinking about extended services for passports. To give you just one spontaneous idea while we're talking at this moment, why wouldn't at some point an insurance company just read the passport and give you a proper suggestion how to find a matching insurance contract that's not exaggerated, which is exactly matching the product. Just to come up with one idea, but I'm sure there will be an ecosystem. I want to stress the iPhone idea, but let's say the iPhone became not a phone with glass keyboard. It turned into a platform where tons of developers do tons of things. Maybe with a much reduced view, but nevertheless, products and product-oriented services, I could picture a lot of ideas by creative people who start to think about, oh, if every product has a machine-readable passport, there are so many other products and options and services I could actually provide if I know right away much better than before, what is the product they're talking about? And how can I contribute to keep it around? And if not, to responsibly put it into a proper waste management and recycling. You touched on the marketing a little bit there. What? Why are marketing the services part so uh, important in your view on the DPP? What is what is your views on that? Well, the, the many aspects to be honest. From from a from a marketing perspective of a company, there is usually always the question: How do I aggregate? Every information that is relevant, pre-sales, every uh, information that is relevant is a so-called second moment of truth. You made a decision, you are at home. How can I support you the best to be happy with the product? In the past, we were focusing on unpackaging and manuals, and we talked to marketing people. But let's say nowadays, you don't want to see a manual. You don't want to read a 
15 page, 15 languages, and, oops, I'm sorry, 15 languages in a book that you throw out right away anyway. So you would rather have an easy introduction with a video clip how to set it up. And this kind of thinking keeps on going. If I can, as a manufacturer, upgrade passports over the lifetime, then marketing becomes relevant to understand what did I do not perfect, what may I provide us better information. And maybe even upgrade and cost selling options saying, if you have this, you might be interested in using that. And I think the huge difference is it's all non-obtrusive, different. If you open your web browser, you don't have so many choices not to see any advertisements. If it's you tapping through your product, it's you deciding, now I want to deal with my product XYZ and see if I find some better options to extend it, repair it, or replace it. So it's something entirely different than being in the storm of communication, which is a picture of marketing, which you might not appreciate. It's much more like it's relevance driven, it's non obtrusive. If it's actually the fine line of being a well defined servicing a customer and an experience, then overloading with a thousand options you might not even be interested in. Why are service providers like in Naravero uh, a rele uh, so relevant for a quick success to get people on the right side of history, get them into the future, get them to scale, to help them? with things. I think that is one of the typical dilemmas. The more we talk about sustainability and all these things, they are complex. And usually complexity always needs lots of different experts. And that creates a hard, hard path to get there. And service providers, in my understanding, are helping businesses to keep their focus on the things they want to do, which are their core business questions. Service providers just make those aspects so much easier that are relevant, but you do not need the entire infrastructure yourself. That was already the, at least the, my conviction for, for quite a while to do that approach to make it easier, specifically I think internationally for many regions and many different company sizes. On top of that, and that is what which has turned out in legislation, our European Commission started to think about we need service providers as well because we want to ensure that you, you can access passports over a long time or you might have even companies or in other words you might have products being around where the company is not anymore around or has been sold or has been taken over by somebody else whatever and so um service providers are the, the intermediate part ensuring that it's easy to set it up without having all the deep knowledge and the details it's easy to put it into production on large volume and it's easy to have backups over a long time without the need to set it up all on yourself. That's the idea of providing it as a service. I, I really see this, and I, I, I'm sure it plays a role in it. So I not only see as a service provider for the digital product passport, I also see that there's probably going to be eventually something on uh, everybody's phone or their own uh, GPT or their own kind of profile as a person, their own you have your own passport, uh, Mark, as my my German or American passport has a, a few extra things in it in my phone that says, you know, I, I, I like this type of food, I like this colors, I like this type of product, I, I uh, really want those things so that when you, you scan or when you're looking things and you maybe can even get suggestions for those those right things that are coming out in the future, I see that opposite side of it as well as a, as another opportunity to kind of how can you set up so that you're being suggested, no, you have a lactose intolerance, you have a, a food allergy, or you only buy, you know, fair cotton or clothes that have been produced in, in the right way and haven't been transported all over the world, so things like that. I think that's really going to be coming down the road quicker than we think. I mean, just as you mentioned how quick the digital product passport was voted on as coming in the first phases of what's going to go into force come soon. Why should we start now and not wait till these legal deadlines uh, are enforced or in the transition? Why is it better to be ahead of the game and start now instead of say, oh, well, I'll wait till that comes out or I'll wait until uh, all the other countries debate whether they're going to get on board or start. I think there are two good reasons why to start early. 
One is my internal view as a company, as a business. If I know that's coming anyway, and if I know that will enable, enable every of my products to talk through that digital interface, but I'm also aware there's a certain amount of complexity in getting all the data together, understanding the process of publishing, putting it and integrating it into your production and all these questions. I think it is smart to start in iterations and learn one step at a time instead of waiting to do all at once. And so from an internal perspective, I think it is smart to be as early as possible setting up, learning the processes, the people, the information, the structure, everything else, what I need, maybe changes in some of my production processes to have QR codes printed or have chips inserted into my products, whatever the, the technology might be. That's the internal view on, I think it is be ready to learn since the passports will change, it will grow over time and the early hours can start with the easier I can actually handle the situation once more and more requirements coming up. And the other good reason is my external point of view. If I do know already now, we will have that interface, let's say by law, enabling everyone to talk to my product. Why wouldn't I start right away and using that for my customer centricity view or customer experience view to provide that interface as early as possible with all the options even if I'm not enforced to do so right now, there's so much opportunity in getting an, an owned communication channel between brand and consumer to talk through the product. That is, um, I think, a very big opportunity. I do as well. So I do a lot of things in Asia, a lot in Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and China as well. Um, we saw a lot of things that I think really nudged the progress of the digital passport, uh, product passport, and, and also the taxonomy and things coming down. In my opinion, because of the disaster that we saw with the supply chain during the pandemic and the things that happened there, smart contracting started to emerge. A lot of um, things happened with the act of God clause, kind of the uh, intervention of pandemics and world issues where a lot of contracts were broken. Organizations, countries, regulators are seeing around the world that there is a, a better standard, there's a better, more digital way that we should be doing things to uh, be future fit for these uncertainties that are coming around in the, in the world. Uh, it really ha is important because why why is china why is thailand why is vietnam why are the philippines talking about esg and having me do workshops you know there to get them ready um i i honestly believe because it's important and because it, uh, they see that future um, more than ever it's not just what i'm saying it's not just the european union it's a lot of countries outside of the european union that are sending products to europe and receiving products from europe or part of the scope one two three that all fall into to line of that what do you think that the real unseen numbers are what the big reach is of the dpp globally beyond the European Union? you think it's a lot bigger than we think or realize? And maybe can you put that into perspective for us? More than happy to do so. I, I believe there is um, one strong signal that occurred first time October last year. There was a, it was a white paper published by the United Nations starting to consider what is happening there in Europe and what does that actually mean? And it didn't really take long Four months later in February this year, they published already a standpoint white paper on the United Nations interacting in trade over the world to have a digital documentation going along with the product. And let's say, and I, I think only today, if you think about customs or if you think about supply chain documentation with all the certifications and um, the documentation and seals and all that stuff, how many of those documents are just scans paperwork and you have a huge effort to see if they are real, if they are authentic, if they are valid, and what actually is the data contained in there. 
So these questions, regardless whether it's Europe or the United States or everywhere else on the planet, with different maybe um, focused priorities, but coming in the end to the same bottom line, all, all that information gets something that is interchangeable, has an interoperability interface across borders, tweet data, and maybe extend information and then forward it to someone else. I think that is a huge thing that would just affect more or less um, most of the global economy. Absolutely. And, and we have a lot of uh, similarities as kind of how we grew up with this technology affinity, affinity and also printing and marketing and, and things. I, I think we've seen this and been fortunate in a way to kind of always be on this cusp of where the digital transformations are going in the world. and. People, you know, say, hey, Mark, you're an economist, you're a tree hugger, an environmentalist, a hippie. What, what are you talking about technology and these, di you know, digital product passport? And what does that have to do with the environment and stuff? And never before in human history have we transformed or transitioned from one epoch or age to another without innovation, without technology, the pneumatic tire, the steam engine, the printing press, the Internet. You know, those are all been major things that have transformed the way we live, think, and work. And we're at the cusp of a new age right now, a new super cycle that involves, you know, biotechnology, wearables. Uh, it's involving the digital product passport. It's involving AI. And you're really at the cusp of Narvero that you're, you're already using, you know, the digital product passport. You have talking products. You have uh, the ability to not just do that work to get a digital product passport for someone, but the technology to say, here, here's our system. Here's the tools. Let, let us train you. And you can, um, you can take that control into your hands and, and give those, uh, those products, uh, there. Do you think um, this is the empowerment and the transition to really meet that digital revolution, that digital transformation we've been talking about for years? Is this another step in that right direction to truly make that transformation? Absolutely. And let's say just starting with having the tree to take a very simple start. If you buy any tool today or any appliance, you get like a thick manual with I don't know, 50 languages in there. Probably store it somewhere in the basement, and whenever you will need it, you will never find it again because it's out there where you actually really thought it is. And this is just like throwing out for nothing, just starting with a simple example, replacing this kind of manuals, instructions, how to do things with a tappable interface that is in every product. It gives you, it opens up a new door that makes a lot of these traditional things obsolete. There is no need for cutting the tree first, making paper out of it, printing it, shipping the book to your home in order to have it sit in the basement and then go back to the recycled paper without ever having had any good purpose. Maybe the first two minutes when you unpacked and you were not sure what the switch means. But other than that, it never has a meaning. And I think that makes no sense. If you have the, 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 I don't know, an electric drill in your hand and you just you tap your phone and see, okay, this is a way to switch the battery and turn it on and off and all the other things. You don't need printed manuals. And that's like the very easiest example of why, why I believe once products have an unlimited digital extension as a standard, everyone knows, not not today, but everyone knows since it's defined, standardized, there's a legal frame for it. A ton of different things just disappear immediately. And you, you mentioned AI a couple of minutes ago. What we did is for some of the passports, we took them is an automatic training for conversational AI so that if you think a product and sustainability information is complex, we, we have on the other hand, like just you can just speak and ask only that point of question that's important to you instead of reading through hundreds of pages of things you maybe just don't want to read. And so these things are not possible without thinking it with a digital extension to a physical product. That's why I think having that extension in a, let's say, in a standard manner, not just an arbitrary uh, expectation, but in, in a standard environment is a huge impact. And think about QR codes five years ago, who used them? In my world, there were only a few people who, who were like eager to scan a QR code just for curiosity. Now everybody knows what it is. Everybody knows how to access it. Next level is 
what is my expectation, what I'm about to see once I scan a QR code for a password or once I tap the product to access the password. That's the next stage of having a digital world right away linked to every physical. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's so spot on. I personally have uh, been traveling to Asia for a long time and and the, the QR codes and the scans have been around for a lot more than 10 years. WeChat and, and, and um, the different applications for those. So I, I was really used to it, but I was surprised how many people around the world weren't. And then the pandemic came and boy, every, you know, if, if you could go to a restaurant, there was a little QR code, for, uh, you know, for the menu because they didn't want people touching menus and to transmit things that way. There was a QR code in Germany before you could go into a restaurant, you'd scan that to just verify that you've had the vaccine or that you've, you're, you're safe to go into a restaurant. Uh, everything, the QR wave basically popped up and, and I saw it was such a better way uh, um, to, to move forward. It's right there, it's digital, it's quick, it's easy. And, and, but I also saw, you know, the, the elderly I say, I don't even have an app, I don't have a phone here. There's things like that, but it's such a small few percentile that, that is in that area. This, the majority is really moving to this ease of use and, and to the future, to really where, we are, where we're at. What out of everything that we've discussed and your, your thoughts on the digital product passport, the taxonomy, the European Green Deal, did we not cover that you think that we're still missing or we need to know that that uh, you, you'd like to touch upon that we haven't covered here so far? I think we covered most of it. I think the, the, the bottom line is the key understanding. The digital passport is the great opportunity of combining sustainability and compliance as a thing we need to do with customer experience and centricity as a thing we should do in future. These, I think, are the two most important aspects which we already covered. One last that might be it's a side impact, but nevertheless wants to mention is, by the way, there is a nice, nice side effect. Authenticity of products is different. Like every product can say true connection to a passport, IRC, fake products, all that kind of issues related with products that look like their originals are not maybe not safe don't you know, don't provide the same characteristics like all kind of that stuff is also in, affected by the passports since they give you an opportunity to verify the authenticity of a product but i don't want to put that on the center of the stage it's just an addendum which just crosses my mind i think the most important point is there are so many different benefits from the fact that you could comply with what's next in sustainability and at the same moment enable a whole new world of a digital communication channel directly to the customer staying there for years or even decades depending on the I, I, I wish we had that uh, digital product passport for all our politicians so that we could have that authenticity and that transparency with them but at least we're getting it for our products and that, uh, that it's coming down the line. I, I, I have just a few more questions for you that um, kind of related to the DPP, but they're uh, on a much bigger scope. Uh, the hardest question I have for you today is, is what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? That is a very good question, and I'm, of course, not really prepared for that. But I'm about to put it in a few really significant sentences is not that easy. In my understanding, huge amount of easy accessible information for everyone is enabling a lot of freedom to make the right decisions for the things you want to see tomorrow. And whatever contributes to that in my understanding is something that is key to have a change actually happening that's not only good for today, but also good for tomorrow. I hope that gives you some sort of a sense. Um, uh, absolutely, it's it's your it's your. What does a world that works for everyone look like? And so I I just wanted to to ask you that. Um, it's something that I've been doing in a social experiment and uh, asked about thirty six hundred people on video that. So 
there's no way you can escape that, uh, Thomas. And um, I yep, definitely uh, appreciate your answer. And don't don't feel bad. I've had many people get nervous or say I'm not prepared or whatever. In in, in our world, uh, to make a world that works for everyone, um, and and what that looks like is is very complex. It's uh, it's all eight plus billion people to get a world that works for everyone. We're just talking about the digital product passport and how many people had to vote to get that pass, which thank goodness it was, and how many people uh, thought of the process and the plans and the rollouts and, and all that that's behind it. And that's just one thing that will make life easier and nicer and, and, and do a lot of good things to transition us into that new future, whereas to make a world work for the entire world has, has a lot more moving parts and and things that we we should do and think about. And so uh, I definitely see the digital product passport uh, and the potential it has, not only under the European Green Deal and the taxonomy to just shift our world and nudge us in the right direction to an easier lifestyle, to an easier way of dealing with things, and also uh, just that knowledge and, and things that we, we don't, we'll, we'll say, Back in the 90s or back in the uh, 21st century, can you believe it? They actually printed out manuals and paper and all this stuff to do this. And it's just a different world that it will be in. And it's ushering in that age to to make life easier, but also healthier and, and better for all of us solving a lot of a lot of problems. And I really think that's a, a big factor. Uh, the last question I have, uh, you can say something. Did you want to say something? I actually would like to add one thing, Mark, too. You and I know, for instance, on um, regarding farming and food, how important it is not only to look at the product as a result. You and I know, know a good farmer. I think, anyway, I will put it in this recording and cut it out. You and I know, for instance, Benedict Bursel is a is a person representing a new Absolutely. view on regenerated farming. If it gets visibility next to the farm product, it can be taken into account when making a decision. If you just look at the piece of meat or whatever else farm product, it's so difficult to find any distinguishing characteristics. So that's why I believe making things visible and and aiming people to look at the things if they want to, to make better decisions, is key to have these decisions happening. If it's happening behind the scenes, then somebody does the best thing at all, but it never becomes any communication channel to the people making the buying decision. Probably it will be an idealistic thing, but not being any relevant to a change. That's why I believe it's so key to make things visible. I absolutely agree with making it visible. And yeah, uh, Benedict Basel and I both spoke in Malta at, a, at an event, just the Green Vision Summit and Expo in Malta. And it was a beautiful event. And he not only is a great advocate for German-speaking countries, but for the world for regenerative agriculture, better practices, a different way of doing things. I mean, uh, let's think about it and let's kind of try to get the comparisons to the digital product passport. Farming is somewhere between 12,000 and 16,000 years old. And we've been doing it in a very unsustainable manner and with conventional and industrial agriculture practices at the cost of our health, our environment, our climate, all, all sorts of things are coming out, uh, animal welfare and, and many other things. So. Uh, it's a big thing, but just because we've been doing it so long doesn't mean that we've been doing it right. And Benedict Boesel's come along in the German market, and he's one out of many, but the leader in regenerative agriculture and has products and is doing things just amazingly. And uh, I kid you not, he ran to you to get his meat and his products uh, on the market with the DPP and as an advocate, and not only to show that transparency because he sees how important uh, this is and uh, to be that firm runner. For those who don't know Benedict Bezo, he has a Disney Plus series that's uh, called 
Farm Rebellion. It's a uh, fabulous. He also has a book that he accompanied, and and it's great for the German speaking markets. Not only to show a different way of doing agriculture, but then he actually puts that into practice on the products and how we should do things a little bit differently. Let's nudge ourselves towards that future. Definitely, uh, I think that I'm glad that you brought that up. But, and that and it's not just him. We've we've seen some other people that you're working with that are really they see the potential and they see the value of why we would want to go in that that direction. The majority of people who kind of come to us or hear about what we discuss or or not only digital product passports, the the taxonomy, the CSRD, the new Green Deal, the European Green Deal, and um, the other things we talk about in business, the only regret I've ever heard from any of them is they wish they would have started sooner because it's a better business model. It's a better life model. Things are more easy. They have a better business. There's more uh, positive profits. There's more things that are impactful in a positive way, not just for the bottom line, but for life and for their organization. And so that's the biggest regret that I I, I hear is, boy, I wish I wasn't didn't jump on it. I wish I would have jumped on it sooner uh, and not waited so long and said, you know, all of this, I got to comply or do something like that. And it, it, it's not just us. It's the Stern Review who wrote a huge report uh, um, saying that was the biggest thing. Why didn't companies always say we should have started sooner because it's just a better model to do it in these practices instead of fighting and saying we got to play catch up. Um, the last question that I have for you is, in your journey, in your professional life experiences, you kind of were uh, mentored by these professors who were your parents and technology and math and studied, you know, taught in, uh, in academia, and then they gave you access to the, the f first computers and showed you technology, and you've had this this uh, journey of love-hate or however it is with technology and seeing the evolution. In this long journey, is there anything um, where you say, uh, boy, I wish I would have known this from the beginning. I wish I would have known this uh, sooner. Or uh, is, is there anything like that in this journey that you've had or your professional life that you wish you would have known from the start? Mm. That's an interesting question. I actually have not really thought about that, but I'm trying to come up with a quick, quick response on that. And while I'm trying to, I can tell you that, like most people stuff. say, most people end up saying, "Boy, I, w I wish I would have started sooner. If I would have known this sooner along this journey, I would have started sooner." But a lot of people also say, and I, I say this is real. It's about the journey. I've enjoyed the journey, but had I ha have come to this uh, something, I wish I knew from uh, the beginning, I would have just started sooner. You know, I the minute I uh, got the training from Al Gore and and had that enlightening moments of some insights of those things um, to just execute, you know, I would start sooner because I think I would be much further along today. So picking that up, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I wouldn't really say that there is one thing that I would have wished to know earlier. It's a mix of two feelings. The one feeling is I do definitely like to, and do definitely enjoy actually to, um, to see this journey of digital development over the 40 years, roughly, that in the bit more than 40 years that I'm part of that. And um, nevertheless, I, I think that is a bit of a, a, a new thing that I would consider to be happy to have started earlier. I mean, if you see now how there is so much possible integrating technology into daily life of, of not really everyone on the planet, a lot of people using their ability to access technology every day in lots of different places on the planet. I wish I would have recognized some of these opportunities earlier and not thinking about the business aspect of it, but believing there would be more options than just the social media spread that's everywhere. They <laughs> put it that way. I think there are more opportunities we could have used this technology accessibility 
for other purposes as well. It's just that. I don't know if that makes you, gives you some sort of sense what I, what I consider that might be good if I would have known that beforehand. But as I'm saying, it's a mixed feeling. Sometimes I think the journey itself is good and skipping moments not necessarily helpful. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Thomas, for letting us inside of your ideas, for sharing all these things. And um, well, hopefully um, everyone got the understanding what a digital product passport is, the potential uh, of size and opportunities we have for the future. And uh, got a little bit excited as I did and, and, and you are to jump on on uh, the wave to to be prepared for what's coming and to to get your products in the digital product passport. We've heard it here. We've got you. Uh, thank you for uh, carrying the flag and and setting up the work and empowering people to to be future fit and prepared for what's coming. And I look forward to seeing you very soon and speaking to you soon as well. Thank you so much, Mark. It was a pleasure to have this talk with you and it was a pleasure to discuss the different views we had. And I'm more than excited to see you soon again, hopefully in person. And thank you so much for hosting me today. You bet. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.